Hi, my name is Yana. I'm a modern Ajma mom. I'm going to talk about the seven books that I read in the month of January. I, I want to be timely. I'm very cognizant about being late. I want to be timely, but I also want to have enough distance to think upon my readings. So very sorry, but these videos are going to cut. And also I'm just busy. Like all of February, I've either been sick or under the weather, or taking care of my sick family members, so that's the other issue. I'm a busy mom. So these videos are just gonna come out when they come out, sorry. I'm gonna start off with the two books that I reread, Eileen by Otessa Moshfeg. I think I read back in 2021, so I might not have ever talked about this in a video. Maybe I have, I, I don't remember, but I reread this for a book club that I'm now a part of. I chose Eileen because the movie had just come out and I'd watched it. I was very underwhelmed and it had been a minute since I read Eileen, which I have always felt has been, is my favorite Moshfeg. So felt it was time for a reread. When I first read this, I think for the most part, and also just FYI, I have read everything Moshfeg published. I think I haven't read like some of those like special short stories that she published separately. Like there's that one special edition like museum published short story. I don't know. Like uh, the main Moshfeg books, I have read them all. And out of all of them, Eileen is my favorite because I feel like it's just the most straightforward. It's the most like... Do you want to know what Moshfeg is like? In perhaps the most conventional, palatable way, Eileen is it. The other one is definitely my year of rest and relaxation, but I just preferred this story over that one. And very immediately, I was reminded of just like how the movie reminded me, the book just as equally reminded me of Moshfeg just pointing her finger at like p oozy pus, lime green bile puke, poking her finger into an open wound, and, and like the general sense of the Debbie Downer, <laughs> the Debbie Downer of the party who's just constantly pointing out all the crappy parts of life <laughs> when no one asked. So in my brain, that is the sense that I get from Moshfeg books. And personally, I find them very fun. I find it like, you know, in the dark humor category. Sentences like, every day I picked up a dozen snot-filled tissues marked with lipstick, like fat, dead, pink-tipped carnations. Upon this reread, I just, I was reminded of all of these devices that depict not just her, but like all of women's isolation, repression, very big on repression. For instance, like all the questionnaire answers at the prison that Eileen gives to the mothers of the boys for shits and giggles, really. Like the icicles on her front porch, like metaphorical prison bars in her own home. I found it this time around very overwritten, almost in the sense of um, Chelsea G. Summers, The Last Supper, is that what it's called? <laughs> I've already forgotten, and I'm pretty sure I read that in December. <laughs> However, this reread, it's all very clear of what she's going for. Like, her very loathsome dad is the racist hero with the gun. But this reread, I totally got what I did not at all catch from my first go around. He totally 100% raped his older daughter aka her whorish older sister. You get that sense in the scene when he's drunk out of his mind and Eileen's driving them both home and he calls her her sister's name and gropes Eileen's breast. We understand that Eileen's mom is the Mrs. Polk who didn't survive. Neither of them sur- Sorry, spoilers, I'm so sorry, but I feel like just I've been watching so many people talking about this book and no one talks about Mrs. Polk in the book. And in my opinion, at least, although I, like, <laughs> I'm 100% I'm sure that I am correct in this, Mrs. Polk is 
the point of this book. But Eileen's mom, Mrs. Polk, they're the same women. Neither of them survive and neither of them survive like patriarchy, having to get married and having to raise families and living with their horrific spouses while Eileen did survive because she left the cycle. She broke the cycle. So that is what Eileen is about. <laughs> and I think I talked a little bit about the movie in like a Vlogmas video, but just to recap, I, I'm not a big fan of the director. Um, I really liked the movie that he did that was like Florence Pugh's debut, not because of the movie, but because of Florence Pugh. And as we all know now, she is like our Meryl Streep <laughs> of this generation. So I wasn't really expecting much. I'm also personally just biased against Anne Hathaway. I feel like she always overacts. And in this case for the movie, she and her wig definitely did. And just the other overall general sense that I got from the film, Eileen, is, man, I'm... <laughs> it, the East Coast in the wintertime is so <laughs> gross, so putrid. I wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> I'm sorry for all of you who are. I've just always lived in Southern California and snow, I don't know her. And also just in my personal, like child of immigrant background and my mentality, just seeing how some people, I'm, just seeing how some white people can completely throw away their lives when the system was built for them to succeed in and to watch them waste that, like throw it all away, Rip, like ripping my hair out level of frustration so if you've never read if you've never read Eileen I highly recommend you do so it's quite fun my book club members did not quite <laughs> agree <laughs> I think they this was like our first book club meeting I think they wanted to read something more along the lines of Emily Henry and Colleen Hoover and here I am going let's read Eileen <laughs> Let's read Moshbeck. <laughs> so they were appreciative of a new experience. <laughs> they didn't really enjoy the book. They found it interesting. <laughs> I had fun rereading it. I feel like at this point, if you guys like me and <laughs> the things that I read, and if you haven't read Eileen yet, I highly encourage you to do so, especially if you like stories that have been recontextualized from common tropes of like family and gender normative roles. But Moshveg likes to throw some anarchy into the mix, some chaotic bad, <laughs> a lot of hurt people hurting people. So I've been trying to like change a couple of things, include some extra details of all of the books that I talk about in my videos from now on. One of which is just where, like how I, I, I I've been doing this, but I want to maybe emphasize a little bit more, but like where I purchased the book or how I read the book. So a lot of the times, especially last year, as you saw in like my end of the year wrap up video, I've read a stinking lot of library books. So I've I say all the time, I've read this via a library book or a library audiobook. I've owned Eileen for so long, I don't recall where I bought her. However, I'm pretty sure that I got it through, like, like I bought it at Target. I'm pretty sure you can find this at Target right now. And Target runs so many buy to get the third book free sale. They still do that. And like several years ago, that's how I bought a lot of the books that I own on my shelves. <laughs> Just going forward, I'm I'm gonna try to emphasize like where I purchase my books. I don't I I, I don't really recommend purchasing from Target. It, they're basically the same thing as Amazon. Try to support your local bookstores. And the second thing that I would like to start including into my book wrap ups, I'm gonna try to summarize each book with a one line that just summarizes the whole, not necessarily plot, but like my takeaway of the book. So for Eileen by Otessa Moshfeg, the one line is, don't let murder, <laughs> don't, don't let murder be the instigator <laughs> of escaping your trappings uh, <laughs> of your repression. And also don't trust beautiful educated heroes <laughs> because they will never be there for you in the end. 
And the second reread that I read in January is Lester by Raven Leilani. So yes, I did read both Eileen and Lester back in 2021. I think that's when I started book two making videos, but I think that was the year when I wasn't on camera and I was doing like the hand like overview video format because <laughs> I was just not ready to speak to camera. I record on my phone. I have my iPad beh right behind my phone with all of the notes that I have to go off of when I'm speaking about each book and I write and I write copious notes during my read. I write all of the quotes that I pull so that they're still as fresh in my mind as the day that I read them. And if I didn't have that, I'd just personally be mute on camera, even today. It's so hard for me. I'm just not a like, great communicator. And I don't know why I'm really saying this right now. <laughs> Maybe to just like, if any of you are like that and you love watching booktube, but you don't have your own channel, but you would love to. And maybe that's like the barrier to entry for you, like not being a great communicator. Like, <laughs> and neither am I. It is so hard for me to talk, not gonna lie. So Lester, <laughs> I last read her in 2021 and I did not, I don't remember what I said in the video for whenever I wrap this up. Maybe I'll try to find it and write it in the description box, but I don't remember what I thought initially about Lester other than I didn't understand this book. I was super confused by the wife, Rebecca character. I was just overwhelmed by all of the very millennial culture name drops throughout the book. Like it was not overwritten, but fair, like, it was like a whirlwind experience reading this book. So, and also I, I read this when I, oh, I, I remember now. I read this when I went to Hawaii on a family trip. And <laughs> like this story about a, like a hapless millennial woman trying to find her way in life in her early 20s was just very jarring from <laughs> my own, you know, like at the time experience of reading this on a family vacation while I, you know, in my mid thirties, um, it was just such a different world. And so I just did not understand her. When I read her, I had more questions than answers, which, you know, sometimes is a good thing. Sometimes it's a great thing. But in this case, I was really just like scratching my head. And so many people love this book, which I totally understand because as confused as I was from this, I did not for one second doubt Raven Leilani's writing. She's an extremely talented writer. Like I felt like I could trust her direction, like where she was going with the story. So all of all of that basically tells me that this book is just not for me, but I still found it very good. So upon this reread, which I have to note was instigated by commenting on Cat's Field Notes video. I can't recall. <laughs> I can't recall what, why, how we were talking about Lester. Maybe she read Lester or reread Lester, but we were just talking about this book again and I decided to reread it. So so this time around, I'll just say straight off the bat, I understood it more. I totally get why I didn't understand and why I thought that it wasn't for me because it really is not. And I saw why I still like this enough because it is actually very funny lines like, I think to myself, you are a desirable woman. You are not a dozen gerbils in a skin casing. <laughs> Based on his liberal use of the semicolon, I just assumed this date would go well. <laughs> uh, just right away, I was thrown back into the frenetic anxiety, hormone riddled uh, life of a 23 year old woman <laughs> who likens herself as the human equivalent of a cheaper version of a fast Italian car and feels like a sack of kids underneath a trench coat. <laughs> And I gotta be honest with you, I've never felt that way. I feel like I was born as an old woman. I'm just one of those types of people. And I'm sorry to say that I've never personally suffered from, what is it even called? I can't even, I can't even recall what that's called. Uh, the feeling where you don't belong complex. I <laughs> oh, inferiority complex. <laughs> uh, I don't know her. <laughs> so... So um, that is why in 2021, this book just did not speak to me. I was not knowledgeable. I was a middle-aged suburban mom. I was just not part of this like lingo, this culture. 
this state of being. And you know, today I'm obviously still not, if anything, entrenched even more so in my differences. But you know, since then, I guess I've just seen more examples to recognize it better. So, so the difference today is I'm just able to recognize what I didn't see before. The quote that I pulled is, I think of my parents, not because I miss them, but because sometimes you see a black person above the age of 50 walking down the street and you just know they've seen some shit. You know they are masters of the double consciousness, of the discreet management of fury under the tight surveillance and casual violence of the outside world. You know that they said thank you as they bled, and that despite the roaches and the instant oatmeal and the bruise on your face, you are still luckier than they have ever been, such that losing a bottom tier job in publishing is not only ridiculous, but offensive. Amazing. Wow. And as to the character of Rebecca, I can only assume the reason why I just was so confused by that character and just did not understand. Like, basically, she was the reason why I did not understand this book. I had no idea what her plot device served, what, why she, <laughs> why she was there, what her relationship to Edie was supposed to do. And it's just one of those things where, you know, like your blinders, maybe not all the way have been taken off and it's just one of those like embarrassing things that I'm like how could I not see this before like how shameful on my part the whole purpose of Rebecca's character is to show like the racism of of the current state of things of who ha of the haves and the have-nots the whole indictment of the our racial class structure and just the first time that I read this I was really reading more for plot and was overwhelmed by the vibes of everything and and that really is the point it's not necessarily so much about the plot of like all that's happening to these characters it, it's really just like an overwhelming like care bears power beam to the reader of this is what it feels like to be in this millennial hell <laughs> um in a book <laughs> so ultimately I still more or less feel the same that I did the first time around. Like just, I'm very impressed by the sheer force of writing. And I'm also still underwhelmed by like a solutionless conclusion. I don't really like books that even if they're super well written are more or less a how did we get here type of statement. So maybe the one line for Lester can be generational scars run deep to the bone. I read All This Could Be Different by Sarah Tinkham Matthews, which I'm clearly reading a library book for, and I also mostly read it via library. There, no glare. <laughs> I also mostly read this via library audiobook, which was read by Verena Dutt. Oh, which is so good. I highly recommend the audiobook. I lived for her high-pitched femme New Jersey accent of uh, the character Marina. And I'd also just <laughs> like to thank Cat's Field Notes for <laughs> basically being responsible for this entire video of reads because I'm pretty sure this was in her like top 2023 reads of the year and I was very intrigued from everything that she said about this book and I also really enjoyed this. It's a very queer millennial economy, uh, capitalism, like working life, child of immigrants and the whole keeping and juggling secrets of very much the norm <laughs> in life. Like your messy early 20s, moving to another city for work, and having to like build your own community from scratch and therefore unraveling each other's complexities. The class differences between the friends who got good jobs and the ones who are living in poverty. The ever so fun game of who won capitalism. And I hope we all know that nobody wins in that game. There's, <laughs> oh, and like the absolute suckiness of <laughs> Milwaukee winners. <laughs> and like the current trend of like dreaming of a commune. <laughs> this book kind of reminded me of um, 
Johamnia's Three Runes, but like the American version, very much the disillusionment of the American dream, but also with a hefty side of the vindication of righteous justice from Midwestern grassroots culture. I think Johamnia is a smarter and better writer but this book just personally resonated more. It also has that friend group community that just always gets me in the feels. I did not have on my 2024 bingo card that I would well up over a climactic scene involving lush bath bombs, but here we are. I, I highly recommend this. I really like this a lot. Also, this is a contemporary book about young people that I actually really liked. <laughs> I, ha I have to shout this from the rooftops then in that case. So this book and I just want to PSA that more often than not, keeping secrets is what is actually holding you back and you should just let it go and embrace living your honest truth. I know that like obviously a secret is a secret for a reason, but just personally I'm of the opinion that the faster you pull off that band-aid, the faster you're gonna heal. So the one line for All This Could Be Different by Sarah Tinka Matthews is, you're gonna make mistakes when you're young and with luck you will learn from them. <laughs> I, I read a couple celebrity memoirs this month and Dave Grohl's The Storyteller is the book that my husband and I read in our couples book club. It was something that my husband thought about, suggested that we do in order to spend more time together and so he he personally purchased this book uh, at Barnes & Noble but there was a library audiobook read by the author so that's primarily how we read this. However, I do suggest at least looking through the physical book because there are a lot of photos and memorabilia. So I know who the Foo Fighters is. I know who Dave Grohl is. I know, I know a couple of their songs, but like I knew Everlane, not by title, but just from like the melody. Like I could... I recognize the melody. So that's my level of knowledge of this person. And this is just one of those like only in America <laughs> for white men types of stories that there's just nothing else that <laughs> there's just nothing else like it. Like he had a 70s Brady Bunchy freewheeling childhood getting into scrapes and and not really having any repercussions but also he's like a I mean I guess the only word for this is a musical genius he was never classically trained he was never properly trained and he to this day has never been and he just has one of those like very sensitive ears that can pick out a tune and that's just like the don't fix what's not broke mentality to the extreme. <laughs> so I, what I mean to say by the only in America stories is he is a he is a human example of upholding that exceptionalism that finds existence under the perfect storm, like the perfect ecosystem of freedom and like fostered TLC and support. In this case, he speaks it's very notable how much he speaks to his speaks of his mother and her unconditional love and support. Like I thought about this YouTuber. He's like a he's one of those music reaction video YouTubers, but his name is Sam Johnson. I'll link the video in the description box. But he was reacting to a video of. Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas talking about how they wrote their first album together and how their mom, like she would tell them that they could stay up as late as they want as long as they're working. And for them, their work is music. And so that's, that is the kind of support that they received in order to get to where they are today. And it's just such a like beautiful and unfortunately rare type of love that we don't see often enough in the art in the arts that it brought a tear to both his and my eye <laughs> so that's you know <laughs> the kind of background that that Dave Grohl has had all his life 
that helped him get where he is today. His writing I found to be very plain spoken but articulate. I always think that songwriting is just the next level of genius. Like it's one thing to write words but another thing to put them into music. It just but it just hurts my brain to think about it. And I also recall Stephen Colbert saying when he was interviewing somebody that he doesn't really fangirl with actors, but he definitely does with musicians. And I also, I also agree. There's just something about musicians where I'm, no matter how like unintelligent in personality they may seem, they are still musical songwriters. And that is its own type of like superpower that is beyond me and that I, I personally highly respect. And so all of this is to say that Dave Grohl, the person, the personality is like a very uh, like middle-aged jokey dad. <laughs> like I kept thinking of the, and, and I will again put the link in the description box, but I, the whole time that I was reading this book, I kept thinking of the SNL, please don't destroy, um, three normal goths skits like that is the the vibe from from this book from Dave Grohl like complete like down to the ghost stories that he includes in this memoir I don't believe in ghosts there's tons of name drops of rock stars that alas eludes me because I just don't really know who they are nor care. <laughs> so if you're a fan of Dave Grohl or this genre, I think you'd really like this because this book feels very him. Just It's a lot of career stories. And at the end of the day, his like good-natured normie vibe made me smile. And he also gets this very right. This is the quote that I pulled. Courage is a defining factor in the life of any artist. The courage to bear your innermost feelings, to reveal your true voice, or to stand in front of an audience and lay it out there for the world to see. The emotional vulnerability that is often necessary to summon a great song can also work against you when sharing your song for the world to hear. It's the courage to be yourself that bridges those opposing emotions. And when it does, magic happens. So yes, I recommend this if you're a fan of this type of thing. Otherwise, I mean, you're probably not going to be interested. So it's good. And the one line for this book is, he has a great mom. <laughs> or I guess as Dave says, he's ordinary. I read Paris the Memoir predominantly through the library audiobook read by the author. If you watched my Vlogmas, you would have seen that I purchased the book from like Barnes and Noble's 50% off end of the year sale. And since then, <laughs> I have gifted it to a friend who is just a big Paris fan. So it will be more loved at her house than in mine. I came into this book with so much sympathy because I knew in advance like what it's about. I knew that she suffered a lot in her teenage years, but almost immediately I was forced to take my sympathy away. Just with lines like, my parents tolerated my pet menagerie. No, it's maids. We made prank calls with randos. She wasted people's time. Dumb nannies. No, they're definitely terrified of losing their jobs and terrorized by her bullshit. Sexiest eighth grader. That's a thing, right? That's what I wanted to be. So I so badly want to focus on the society and not the person. <laughs> but it just blows my mind that she's had all of this time to reflect. And she has written this book. <laughs> that's the product of her reflections and overall she just does not acknowledge anyone but herself and her own tenacity like she's she is only okay because she has money a lot of it and she's protected by all of her privileges so when paris hilton was a teenager she was sent to what's basically a torture camp but in the 2000s it was like a uh rehab for troubled teens and she speaks a lot about it and she's an advocate for closing them down and putting her spotlight on the tragedies that occurred there to this day it's really what this book's purpose is for but she ends up leaving the camp and she feels so strong because 
she survived and she never she was like i never believed them when they told me how worthless i am because i'm a hilton <laughs> like yeah that's that's how you survived not why you survived and there's just so so many bits throughout the book where she's still totally oblivious of the real world but she just keeps that spotlight of injustice focused on herself and how kids like her didn't deserve such harsh treatment which i fully agree with obviously but that's what i mean like there it's 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 obvious of course it was terrible of course it shouldn't have happened and furthermore she just continues to keep placing the blame on other things on everybody else and just saying so many times no one understands ADHD behavior, which is kind of her justification of why she did the things that she did. And throughout the book, it just took me back <laughs> to the 2000s, the halcyon days of <laughs> the 2000s when I was in high school then. And I didn't like really, I, of course I knew who Paris Hilton was, who like the Kardashians were. I wasn't like a fan. Personally to me, they were like the celebrities that I was just like, why are they my celebrity? <laughs> why are they the celebrities of my era? Like, why do I have to know these people? <laughs> just reading her book did take me back to that time and especially now that I'm a parent, seeing how so many parents just don't want to parent their kids <laughs> or, or they're too busy to parent their kids. Like very much, both are very much equal at play. But regardless, these kids are left to fend for themselves and with each other, hence why, you know, like Paris, what's her name? Kim, <laughs> Kim Kardashian and uh, Nicole Richie or like a squad. So the general sense that I got is she has always and still very much so lives in her own world and we're all just living in it. And what was the most reprehensible about this book is her positioning herself to be that smart, sexy role model for other smart, sexy young women who may or may not have ADHD, but regardless, you know, feel downtrodden in some way as long as they laud her as their queen. I just found this book to be so pandering. I couldn't even enjoy all of the celebrity name drops. And most of them I knew. <laughs> like I just had such distaste in my mouth throughout this read. I don't know who needs to hear this, but no one is above basic things like school when you're a child. Like the whole root of her problem seemed like she hated school because it's not fun and she's just better suited to things that are fun stuff and just lines like the people who are paid to educate me failed or like when she talked about the hurt that she felt for not being able to have a facebook account when it first launched because she wasn't a college student it just made me shriek in frustra frustration there's just no ownership of responsibility on her part despite her stating so several times there's feeling remorse and seeking atonement which she is claiming to do but everything else that she said in this book mostly like the blaming and the victimizing proves otherwise and she just keeps claiming that she was uniquely misunderstood. She had the worst treatment. It was all unfair. Yeah, I, I already know that this is going to be in my bottom books for this year, hands down. <laughs> Just so much distaste. Uh, the one line for this, she is not hot. <laughs> okay, I need, to, I need to cleanse myself with Sheila Hetty. <laughs> Save me, Sheila Hetty. I read Women in Clothes, uh, written by Sheila Hetty, Heidi Julevitz, Leanne Shapton, and 639 others. I read this via a library ebook, but since then I have purchased this from Thrift Books, and I am so happy to have found a copy of this because I truly feel like I missed out from the physical copy reading experience. The ebook, I have to say, is very annoying. Nevertheless, I got a good sense of the tone and the purpose of this book. Just 
leave it to Sheila Hetty and whoever she collaborates with for the most cerebral approach to dressing. I know that that was a horrible flip through, but just, <laughs> I wanna pique your interest in this. I highly recommend this. If you're a fan of Sheila Hetty, this is so good. I love this so much. A lot of it is quite long actually, but a lot of the text are like Skype conversation transcripts. And with like a topic of fashion, it just begs to be put it just begs to be shown on, on screen. Like, this is such a perfect documentary material. However, Leanne Shapton says, which I totally agree with and love that she said this, but the this had to be a book because the point are what the women's are what the women are talking about, what the, the women's words are, not what they actually look like. The point is what they think, how they feel about clothes. Oh all the multiple varied topics that were had through conversation. Like, I think my favorite was the Ethical Garter interview, where it's talking about like the factories that make clothing in non-Western countries, pointing out that if you purchase cheap clothing, yes, it's made by mostly women and children who are very underpaid and abused and taken advantage of. But if you're like a social justice warrior and just refuse to, you know, vote with your dollar and not purchase them, those same women and children are left without those jobs and then are forced into things like prostitution. So it's like a, like, what are we, what are we going to do? <laughs> so like, if they're not exploited garment workers, they're abused prostitutes. Like that's just... Like that's part of the ethics of clothing. I pulled this quote, philosophers think through what is taken for granted by most people. I call the stylists practical philosophers because they have that, but their activity is not in their thinking. Rather, their thinking is in their style and the way they move, dress, inhabit the world. There's also a conversation where they were talking about the concept of kawaii, which means cute in Japanese, which is a concept that I've known almost all my life. But for the first time in this book, I was made aware that it's like for our Western, for my Western mind, cute means like, you know, pink, girly, adorable. But in Japanese culture, when they say cute, they mean like basic uh average just like the whole concept of not sticking out negatively is considered kawaii which just like blew my brain <laughs> and i just and it, and it made me realize how much like if you go to asia almost everything is cute and so of course over there cute is basic it's just <laughs> so things like that is what you'll find in this book uh, you really gotta like uh, <laughs> sitting in on a bunch of people's conversations to like this read. I don't know if it could use trimming. I I just really appreciate what this book is, what it, this book is like in every facet of it. I highly recommend it. The one line is, clothing is a negotiation of identity. I read Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keith. I popped my PRK cherry with this red, <laughs> even though I've had this physical copy for a long time now, I read a library audiobook which was read by Matthew Blaney because Kat has stated that the library audiobook is very good because of that Irish lilt, which Matthew Blaney does have in spades. And I'll just say that I still feel run over by a train at how good this book is. The hype is very real. And isn't that such a delectable feeling when, like for years I've heard about Patrick Radden Keefe, I've heard about Say Nothing of his Empire of Pain and how much everybody just loves this writer, this book. And it's a non-fic, like how, how fun could this be? Oh, let me tell you, it is so... I mean, it is a very sad, dark subject matter, but the read is very fun. It is extremely thrilling, compelling. It's a narrative nonfic where he takes all of these disparate stories of like real people and real events and just make them all feel so electrifying 
like a film. Like, I need this to be a documentary. And however, everything in this book tells you why that documentary can never be made. Actually, he is not necessarily a booktuber. I have talked about, I have spoken of him before, but there's a YouTube channel called Horses and he makes these video essays on like historical subjects or historical people. And he recently made an IRA, like the history of the IRA video. However, very ironically, the BBC now owns all IRA like video clips and so they so they blocked his video and he's trying to he's trying to figure out how to how to fix that. And if and when he does, I will be the first to share that video on my community post, like as a community post to watch. It's very well done. And just gave me so much more. It was the, it was just the perfect addendum add-on to this book which I will say focuses much more on like the 20th century duh they're almost all the 20th century like the oh my god the late 20th century <laughs> of the 1990s and the 2000s with like Jerry Adams and because of that I just could not throughout the read stop thinking of the film starring Jackie Chan the foreigner <laughs> where Pierce Brosnan plays uh, like an amalgam amalgamation of the person who is Jerry Adams. And to me, this book is just, just speaks so much to how treacherous, like the treachery, the secrecy, the ruthlessness of people like him. Uh, Trump could never. I mean, I'm sure that there are plenty of other American politicians, but he ain't one of them. At least there's that. Not to make everything about America. And also perhaps... A bit of recency bias but I also kept thinking of the Banshees of Inisherin that might like reflect the people on the lower rung of the ladder who did all the dirty work but with genuine conviction and how tragic it is that they felt so betrayed with how things unraveled just the mind-breaking levels of double agency like the double agents at work but you know, now when they're not all that old and still very much living with the repercussions and not just like the f the several names that are mentioned in this book, but just entire communities at large who have been affected. There is an incredible, breathtaking amount of research in this book. A lot of legwork, a lot of writing by PRK who like immediately after finishing this, I had to Google is his is Patrick Ryan and Keith's life at risk <laughs> like after writing it this extensively on the IRA on the Sackler family in the Empire of Pain I'm like does this man have like thousands of of death threats to his life or what uh google search comes inconclusive <laughs> and I just personally found this book to be a must read if you are someone who knows little to none about Irish history, about the IRA, but have been reading all of these contemporary Irish authors, you know, such as Claire, Fost Claire Foster, Claire Keegan, or, or Sally Rooney, that just provides tons of education of Irish modern history and in a book that's incredibly immersive, real AF naming names that is thoroughly researched. Like when the whole Brexit thing happened, I was also very much confused by what that means. And it's insane how Brexit is involved in this and its consequences will make this kind of impact. Seeing the Irish-Palestinian solidarity today because it is the same settler colonial story as a tale as old as time that we are still seeing as news headlines, not often enough, but still today. So the one line for this, hell on earth is the loneliness of not knowing who your kinsmen are. That's everything that I read in January. It was a good month. I wanted to take January very slow. Seven books in a month could be a new record for me. Uh, February is definitely not the same. Yeah, it's been a good start to the year. Like, I want to mellow down. I want to be a, more focused and more precise in my reading choices and kind of allow that to set the pace, set the tone for this reading year. So, so far, so good. And again, I'm sorry that this 
<laughs> January wrap up is coming to you at the very end of February, but, and I missed talking to you guys. I missed like reading the comments, which is my favorite thing every month. I mean, I know at this point, I know that you all had a, a wonderful January. I hope you're having a great February. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye.